This is a lerping cube with a sphere above its head, which is also lerping the color from a beginning color from blue to red. In this video, I'll be showing you how to recreate the functionality seen here. Timestamps for all of the different sections will be below. So if you want to jump ahead just to the, uh, the functionality snippet, then you can do so. But I would say that this is going to be worth going through in full. And I'm about to show you a few uh, caveats and errors that people make when working with Lerp. It can be very, very simple to use. It's also very, very simple to get wrong. And you even find that sometimes documentation can give you incorrect directions on how to use it. So I just wanted to cover a little bit more in depth on this topic, exactly how and why we should be using Lerp in a certain way. Lerp, if you're not familiar as well, is just shorthand for linear interpolation from getting from one position to another in a linear fashion. So a little bit different in this video from others. Uh, the first two things I'm going to give you are some homework to do. Uh, I'm going to suggest we read this. All of these links will be in the description below. Uh, this you'll notice is for Unity. Linear interpolation or lerping is so kind of universal and generic though. You can easily take the code found in here and translate that over to the lerping functionality. I do want to keep these videos as short and to the point as possible. But like I said, I do feel this one topic does deserve a little bit more information. If you did want to make sure you're using Lerp correctly, then this is a gold mine of information. I would say this is the best thing I've seen for the use of uh, linear interpolation. And like I said, this is going to show you a number of ways that you can use it correctly and explain why these approaches are kind of needed. And this is the kind of result you expect to see by the end of it. So like I've mentioned, we're going to use a very simple version, uh, pretty much using this, but converting it into Unreal C++. And then you can also build upon that. So if you wanted to add in smooth steps or your own specific type of lerping functionality. This is, like I said, super useful as it provides a lot more than just kind of moving one thing from another. You can look at rotation, scaling, adding different sub steps and things like that. So uh, this is the first thing I wanted to share. I definitely recommend giving this a read. It's a really, really well-written documentation or uh, blog on lerping in Unity, but very simple to move over to Unreal. So this is information on how to do it correctly. And in fact, just to say here as well, uh, it, again, it's quite well known that this can be used very easily in the wrong way, which is why I've then got the next example, which is uh, using it in a wrong way. And sometimes I'd say that looking into the bad way of doing something or how others have been using something in the wrong way for a long time is very useful because it's nice to know what kind of thing to avoid. So I'd recommend searching in Google for something like using Lerp wrong. Uh, this is a very good article as well, titled You're Using Lerp Wrong. So I'd recommend uh, tracking this one down but also some of the other search results from google are quite useful just seeing on forums how people have uh, kind of kind of realized after a while that they had been misusing lerp uh, and again reading it this way finding out what has been done wrong there are a lot of different ways that you can misuse lerp so i'm not going to go through them in the video uh, but you may find that you've done something similar yourself in the past and this will kind of just bring that to light for you and let you know why that wasn't actually working as lerp is intended so like I said, beyond this, uh, this is now up to you to go and read this. I'd recommend these two articles at least, and then doing a quick Google search for extra information if you're still interested. With that out of the way, we can jump into the code and see how we can make use of the lerping functionality. So to begin with, in the header file, we're using just a standard scene component here. So like with the interp2 video, if you've seen that, it's just a scene component placed on a cube and moving from point to point. Down below, I have added a few extra things here. These are purely for demonstration purposes, so you might not need all of these. I've added a U material interface and a U material instance dynamic, which is going to help us drive that uh, lerping color change between the, uh, the material on that sphere. I have a float for the time elapsed set to zero, so I'm just presetting this to zero. Pointer to an actor class named parent, which is going to be what we get and fill with the parent reference a little bit later. Again, presetting that to null pointer and an F vector named start location. So these are all private. We don't need these to be exposed with any U properties or anything. And these are all going to be set up and tracked in the functionality in a moment. And then for this example, I'm also creating a new U static mesh component named mesh, putting this in the category of lerp and setting it to visible depot only so we can see this in the editor. This is the sphere mesh I'm going to use for the color change. The, uh, the actual actor itself is just gonna be a cube that I'll drag into the world. Then we have a U property for the F vector type named target location. So this is what we want to get that cube moving towards. And then the final two things are two floats, one named lerp duration 
the other named wait time, both set to a uh, float value of three or int value here of three in the category of lerp as everything else and set to edit anywhere so we can edit these in the editor. Now the lerp duration is hopefully quite clear from the naming, but that's gonna be how long it will take for the cube to lerp or interpolate to its destination. And the wait time is just a demonstration thing I've added. Again, if you've seen the interp2 topic, this is just because if I have it moving immediately, as soon as the editor starts playing or simulating, it looks a little bit choppy because it's kind of lost a few ticks when everything was being loaded into memory. So I'm just gonna make this wait for a second or two so that the lerping animation plays as smoothly as it should. So they are the variables that we're going to need. I'm gonna jump over to the code file and quite simply in the constructor, I'm gonna set the parent to be the result of the get owner function. And I'm also going to create that mesh that we've uh, defined in the header. So we're using the create default sub object of the type U static mesh component, naming this one mesh. So that's gonna be our sphere that we use a little bit later. Moving down to the begin play, I'm gonna get the start location. So this, unlike again, interp2, needs a specific unchanging start location because it needs to know how long it's gonna to take to get from a set location to its destination. So we're gonna set the start location, which is never gonna change in the lerp functionality. And that will be the result of get component location. So we're just getting the scene components location on begin play. In a similar way, we also want to set up our materials. So I'm going to get the material, which is going to be the current one on the mesh, which is our sphere, remember, not the cube. And we're gonna get material index zero. We're then going to create and set up a dynamic material using the U material instance dynamic create. Uh, we pass in the material that we've just set and the actor reference is this. So the actor that this is on or the component this is on in this case. And if you wanted to know more about dynamic material instances, I have a whole topic covering that inside of this C++ playlist as well. Then the final two steps, we now want to take that dynamic material instance we've just created. We're going to call our mesh component set material function. We're gonna set the index zero to be the new dynamic material that we've just created. And then I'm going to just preset the dynamic material and the color of that by using the set vector parameter value, calling the color value within that material instance. And I'm setting that to be blue. So that's going to be, we're starting the lerp of the color from blue to red. As I said, if any of this doesn't make sense, uh, this has an entire topic by itself inside of the playlist though. And this is really just for kind of visual purposes as I thought it looked pretty cool. So functionality inside of the tick component function, quite simply, we're gonna wait for the cooldown time. So for as long as the timer is more than zero, we're gonna take delta time away from that. Again, that's just visual to avoid it looking choppy in the editor when it's loading. The main functionality though, we want to take our time elapsed and check if it is less than the lerp duration. Remember that in the header, we've set time elapsed to default to zero. So the bottom of this calculation we're going to be adding delta time to the time elapsed for as long as this is less than lerp duration. So again, in comparison to the interp2, if you've seen that, this is how we make sure that this has a start and an end time, and then it won't do anything after that. Whereas in comparison, if you wanted something to chase another thing continuously, then you would use interp2, as that will keep calculating the location offset uh, pretty much indefinitely, unless you've got something that you manually implement to override that. So the main thing we're doing here then is we're taking our parent actor using the parent and setting the actor location. And that's gonna be the result of the fmath lerp. And that is going to be lerping between the start location. So remember, this should never change. This should always be the variable where the object is moving from. If you try and update that during the animation, then you're gonna get a kind of jumpy, choppy movement because of the way the calculation is being run. And then we are moving towards the target location. Now the target location can move, but what will happen is if the target location is getting further away, whilst this is calculating, then your object will start speeding up. So really what we're doing is we're guaranteeing that our actor will get to the target location within a certain period of time. And if that location is increasing or decreasing, then we will either speed up or decrease. And that is because of the way that we're using this calculation just here, which is the elapsed time divided by the lerp duration. And these are the things that people can easily get wrong. And sometimes uh, documentation can even be showing incorrect examples of this for quite long periods of time. So the first mistake that people make is generally to have the location being updated along the way as well. And the next thing is either using delta time as the alpha 
or a set speed in which you're trying to move things. The reason that doesn't work is that alpha is meant to be a normalized value between zero and one, zero being the start location, one being the target location, and the time it takes to get between those two, which is why we're using this, and which is why this needs to stay as a constant value which isn't being changed. I've just noticed, you can probably see what that is, but I'll drop that down so it's easier to read. But we're doing a very similar thing for the dynamic material. So we've got the dynamic material set vector parameter value. The parameter that we want to change again is the color. Uh, this time we're going to use the fmath loop for a color, which works in just the same way as the uh, values being changed above. But this time we're going to interpolate the F linear color from blue to red. But again, we're using the time elapsed divided by the lerp duration. So as always, if you're following along, now is the time to compile this and we can hop back over to the editor and we can test our functionality. So now that we have the context of what's happening, again, I'll just show you what I've done to set this up. Um, if you are following along from a uh, fresh project, I've brought in a cube here and I've added the component, the alert. So we now have our alert component. You can see this has done two things. So the first thing is we now have a new mesh, which is the sphere that I wanted to use. And I've quite simply reset the location of this and moved it up a little bit. Now, quite important here, if you wanted to test the color lerping, you need to use a material instance. I've gone for the mi underscore flat gray. And to take a quick look at what this is doing, it needs a parameter named color, which in the parent material, is simply driving the color. Like I said though, all of that is explained in the dynamic material instance topic. If you wanted to know exactly how to set those up and how they work, uh, this was more for visuals for the video. And then the other thing on the lip is I've exposed the vector that we want to move this towards, the target location. And I think I forgot to mention that. So back in the header, this is very useful here. So we're using the meta and on an F vector, you can use the make edit widget equal to true which is the reason we're then able to come in here and we can expose this uh, vector widget and we can just move this around. But rather than manually plugging in a value for this to move towards, we can just use this vector widget. So now with that done, uh, in fact, I'll move these to the side because that one's already moving as well. We now know that this is going to try and move to that point and we can see that this lerping component is moving to that point. And we've got the lerp duration. So remember, because we have this from zero to one, we're normalizing this. We know that this is going to take seven seconds from start or after the wait time, at least from the time it starts moving to the time that it's trying to get to that target location. So if we press simulate, we can see that one started. I think this one had a three second wait time and uh, maybe I didn't give it uh, the ability to move. So we need to make sure the cube is movable as well. And I'll just double check that we have, yeah, the lerp duration is a bit lower. So that one should kind of catch up because it starts later, but moves faster. Okay, and there we go. So that is the lerping functionality done and kind of demonstrated there. You could, like I've done with the interpreter, you could make it lerp from its location to another target's location, another actor's location or something. But the main thing is, like I've said, that we have that set start point, the end point, which can move, in which case, if that did start moving, then this would speed up mid movement. But as you can see there, it kind of confused it. I think this isn't uh, synced up as uh, correctly as it needs to be. But the main thing is that that was trying to speed up as I pulled it away and then slow down as I moved it closer because it's only a note. The main concept is it knows it has exactly three seconds to get from its start location to wherever that end location currently is. So it will adjust its speed to make sure that it hits that point within that time. So that's really it to see how the functionality is implemented in the code, which is really what these videos are for. I know that people like these to be as short form as possible. So outside of this, as I mentioned, you can go and read the documentation if you were interested more in the topic to see exactly how they can work and some of the different ways that you can mix up the functionality to get different results. And also take a look into the uh, wrong ways to use LERP examples to see if you've ever managed to implement any of those in your project. So if you've enjoyed LERPing, be sure to leave a like and share the video around. That will help this reach as many people as possible with some hopefully useful information. And just to make sure that people are aware, you can get your hands on this project and any others that I release for the prototyping or the topics within any of the playlists on the channel over on Patreon under certain tiers. You can get access to early uploads of the videos due to the way that YouTube works. I kind of have to stick to a weekly release schedule in hopes to get any video traction or views on the channel. 
I do tend to batch record and edit three to four videos at a time. So that potentially means you can get access to some of the video content three to four weeks ahead of their public release, because I will put them up unlisted for a set period of time before they go live to meet the YouTube algorithm requirements. So I just wanted to make people aware that that is an option if you wanted to also support the channel and help me to continue making content like this on a weekly basis. As ever, a big thank you to all of the people already supporting over on Patreon. Your continued support of the channel is really appreciated and it allows me to hopefully stop worrying at some point about the YouTube algorithm and just upload and release content as I have the time and availability to do it. So again, a big thank you for all of your support over there. Otherwise, you can support the channel by subscribing and hitting the notification bell, and that will also keep you updated with those weekly releases as soon as they go live. And as ever, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.